Hello, welcome to yet another episode of me talking into my computer. Today, high and late middle ages in Europe, from awakening to autumn. We've already talked about the early middle ages, which is covered in another chapter unit. And remember that in that period, after the fall of the Roman Empire, historians have traditionally thought of the that a uh, few hundred years, early Middle Ages, as a time of decline and decay politically, economically, culturally, but that is uh, a subject of great dispute. More recent historians have tended to see uh, more signs of life uh, and things uh, uh, you know, of a positive nature to speak of. Uh, with regard to the High Middle Ages, which is the middle of the Middle Ages, but uh, this is the time that historians uh, are more in agreement, but not completely, uh, that uh, we see the Middle Ages sort of flowering. And the term awakening uh, uh, comes from uh, an event or series of events uh, called the 12th century awakening, really a cultural flowering that happens in, in the middle of the Middle Ages, uh, something akin to, and maybe this is just another term for, uh, a golden age. Uh, the term autumn in our title, uh, the autumn of the Middle Ages, uh, comes from a famous book uh, about the uh, latter period. And uh, with regard to that third period, so early, high, and late, third period is late, uh, historians don't really argue, at least in a general sense, about whether or not uh, this was a period of decline and decay. It was. And two events stand out in that regard. The Black Death in Europe and the Hundred Years' War, which actually overlapped, uh, happened partly at the same time. So the High Middle Ages was a period of great vitality. Uh, I think that's mostly beyond doubt by now, but there maybe are a few uh, outstanding issues and debates about this. Maybe the the most uh, prominent example of this, especially if you want to see it by going to Europe today, uh, are the great Gothic cathedrals that were built uh, throughout Europe, which for the most part stand uh, even now, even even today, with some uh, exceptions and partial exceptions. As one historian has said, uh, that the not just the stained glass windows, this is a Cologne Cathedral, one of its stained glass windows, and it's one of the great cathedrals, but uh, of the cathedrals in general, the most obvious manifestation of abundance are the Gothic cathedrals, or the great Gothic cathedrals constructed during this period. So not only are they artistically, architecturally, uh, you know, marvels and gems, and they were certainly that, considering the time period, uh, 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 with regard to the technology, uh, but uh, they took enormous amounts of wealth uh, and organization uh, in order to produce uh, and build. We'll start with economic change uh, in the uh, High Middle Ages uh, and uh, the origins of European capitalism, focusing here, at least on this slide, on technology and values. If you remember, and you probably do not, I wouldn't uh, blame you, it was so long ago now, so much has happened since then. Uh, in our first unit on hunter-gatherers uh, in prehistory, we uh, talked about the sort of technology uh, and values of hunter-gatherers and how they actually in many ways go together. So I'm in a sense sticking to that theme uh, uh, toward uh, the very end of our class. Uh, something called the Second Products Revolution, which you see before you, uh, uh, was a major uh, uh, foundational feature of uh, not just economic change and growth, increased standard of living, which is starting to happen at least sporadically in certain places here and there uh, during this period, uh, but uh, it, it helps to sort of lay the foundation for the other uh, elements of uh, vitality uh, that we'll look at. Robert Wright, uh, intellectual, uh, writing a great book, uh, not about the Middle Ages per se, but about this kind of development uh, throughout human history, says in his section on the Middle Ages in Europe, the revolution in agricultural technology, plow, harness, horseshoe, slowly but surely raised Europe's population, making its social brain larger. The result was more and more indigenous innovation, or indigenous refinement of foreign innovations. Uh, as usual in cultural evolution, uh, we've talked about the concept of cultural evolution before, uh, the most important innovations were of three kinds, 
energy technologies, horses, the water wheel, uh, information technologies, uh, which eventually turns into the printing press, uh, other, other uh, significant advances in, uh, but before that, uh, and materials technologies. Uh, this all sounds rather mundane and you know, kind of uh, under the category of who cares. Uh, but uh, all of these things uh, were important uh, uh, f for other reasons, uh, right? Uh, uh, or uh, foundations for other important gains made during this period. The improvements in agriculture, for instance, uh, right? Uh, without those, uh, you would have had a, a, a much harder time, or, or it would have been impossible uh, to uh, to see, uh, you know, growth in cities or the growth of cities whether in the Italian city-states or Northern Europe, the Low Countries, Holland, uh, Paris in France, London in England, uh, etc. Et uh, so the water wheels, uh, for instance, uh, we'll see dotted the countryside of England, uh, thousands of them by uh, the 11th century, if not, if not before. So uh, the, the technology of the period uh, really is sort of eye-popping uh, in many ways uh, here. Now, it says also on here that they refined foreign innovations. The Europeans uh, are famous uh, today and often criticized today uh, you know, in history for stealing uh, other people's inventions. Uh, and there's no doubt that there's truth in that, though that kind of stealing has always taken place and goes both ways, even today. Uh, but so it's often seen as sort of a mark against Europeans that they take credit for everything, get credit for everything, but a lot of what they used technologically, uh, uh, you know, uh, to uh, advance economically, you know, and otherwise uh, was taken from China or India or the places uh, or the, you know, the M M Muslim world. That's all true, uh, um, but uh, one could look at that another way as well and say, well, the Europeans saw these technologies uh, and didn't care who invented them, just put them to use and went, you know, sort of full bore uh, with any technology or idea that they thought uh, uh, would be useful, uh, you know, and turned out to be useful. So uh, either way you look at it, uh, the Europeans certainly did uh, take other people's technology. There was a, an adjustment in values that was required uh, for a, a move to European, uh, to capitalism in Europe, which appears to have begun in northern Italy, as we'll see in the next slide, though that, that's not sort of uh, definitive, but uh, it appears to have begun uh, largely there and then spread fairly quickly uh, through the rest of the Middle Ages. Uh, but the, the main values uh, had to run themselves through or, or be... Uh, in a sense, uh, put into play, uh, validated by the Catholic Church, uh, which had such a huge impact on all of life in Europe uh, in the Middle Ages, not just the, you know, your religious life, if you were a peasant uh, or shopkeeper in one of these towns or cities, the church had a, a role to play uh, and something to say uh, that could be backed up. Uh, at least that Christians, Europeans, even kings uh, would often abide by in terms of economic life, political life, etc. So uh, the value system changing, uh, uh, you know, in favor of or in, a, in, a, in the direction of capitalism, markets, private property, etc., uh, can be seen uh, and maybe most importantly seen in changes in the Catholic Church. Uh, one historian writing about this uh, specific subject says Christian theologians, right, church uh, uh, you know, uh, scholars who witnessed the growing economic activities of the great religious orders, meaning the monasteries, uh, began to think anew about doctrines concerning profits and interests. In this way, the church made its peace with early capitalism. By no later than the 13th century, which is kind of right towards the end of the High Middle Ages, uh, the leading Christian theologians had fully debated the primary aspects of emerging capitalism, profits, property rights, credit, lending, and the like. And capitalism then was freed of all fetters of faith. So the, the church, in a sense, had a debate about this and had to think about emergent capitalism, something they hadn't had to deal with before, and, and at first, the the you know, body of 
professional opinion was against it, or at least suspicious. Uh, and it goes all the way back to uh, the Bible. So there's biblical sanction for you know, uh, suspicion of capitalism. For instance, maybe most famously, uh, there are uh, prohibitions of usury in the Bible, loaning money out of interest. So it's these kind of things uh, that cause a stir and force the church to kind of think this through carefully uh, about uh, whether or not they, their institution, the Bible, uh, can be uh, said to and seen as supporting uh, these new economic changes that we today call capitalism. They didn't use that name, of course, then. Uh, and this quote uh, shows us correctly uh, that the church uh, did make its peace uh, with capitalism. Uh, whether that was interpreting scripture correctly or not, that is the direction the official Catholic church uh, uh, went. Uh, so my point overall here is that capitalism probably couldn't have happened, probably couldn't have gotten off the ground, at least then and there, uh, if it hadn't been uh, for the backing uh, of the church. Uh, if the church had sort of stayed against it and come out more fervently against it, uh, it the church had a lot of clout uh, in those days, politically, uh, economically, uh, you know, spiritually, uh, and pushback could have been uh, you know, catastrophic for capitalist development. The rise of cities uh, and merchants uh, uh, and their long-term impact. So capitalism uh, was centered in the cities, uh, and it appears that first uh, it first sort of found its voice, uh, found its place in the city-states uh, of uh, northern Italy, uh, Venice, uh, Florence, Genoa, uh, and a couple of the others. So uh, I put the beginnings of capitalism with a question mark because there's no way to prove this uh, exactly. Uh, but I think a strong case can be made that we can just put this to rest that, uh, you know, if you, if you wanted to say, you know, with an asterisk, uh, because it might be a little more complicated than that, where did, you know, ask the question, where did capitalism begin? Uh, in the Italian city-states. Uh, was it a coincidence that this began, uh, capitalism, in the Italian city-states? Uh, probably not. Uh, we've already seen uh, in a number of units, uh, I think I mentioned it even in the last one, how city-states uh, oftentimes have a great deal of advantages, some of which have to do, and again, this I think is the key element here, with competition. Uh, they're uh, you know, usually close to each other, uh, they're relatively similar in size, uh, and so they go uh, through this uh, mutually beneficial competition, uh, each one uh, trying to stay ahead of or stay afloat next to the other one, uh, and uh, uh, having to try to uh, think uh, more carefully, uh, uh, innovatively uh, about uh, you know economic innovation, about technology, new ideas about military uh, and uh, politics, uh, in order uh, to stay competitive, which, in a, the sense of a country or a city state, right, uh, competitive can mean survival. Uh, if you're not a competitive government not a competitive economy and government, uh, you might just collapse or get taken over by somebody else. So competitive is not just about uh, economics, uh, it, although that's part of it. Back to Robert Wright again, it didn't take merchants long to sense their common interest. They united into guilds and demanded the freedoms necessary for commerce, not just freedom from outrageous tolls, but freedom to buy or sell property, freedom to enter into contracts, and freedom to decide what other freedoms they needed. Increasingly, in the 11th and 12th centuries, towns won the right of self-government, complete with their own courts and tax collection. Feudal lords soon realized that local prosperity was good for them, and that prosperity required a bit of this freedom. So uh, let's unpack this quote a little bit. It's not exactly self-explanatory, at least if this subject is relatively new to you. So remember that in the early Middle Ages, uh, and some of it extends into this period, the feudal system dominated uh, much of Europe, which meant that uh, political power devolved from kings down to local or regional lords, or dukes, uh, to keep it simple. Uh, and so dukes uh, were used to, even by this period, running the show in their region. And it just so happened that a duke, you know, who usually lived in a castle or, you know, mansion in the countryside, chateau or something in France in the countryside, uh, but uh, their jurisdiction, 
uh, at least technically speaking, uh, sort of uh, had a city or town or towns within it. Uh, but the cities and towns started to develop differently, different value systems, different way of life. Uh, I mean, city and you know, rural areas have that you know, difference today. But maybe more even even more striking then, because uh, capitalism is just kind of entering, especially cities that are port cities, or at least uh, uh, close enough to ports, uh, or uh, land trade routes that sort of go to ports, uh, that they're involved in large scale trade commerce. Sometimes uh, you know on trade routes uh, far and wide. If you trace the products, you know to their destination, ultimate destination, and back. So. But under the feudal system, there wasn't freedom uh, uh, enough uh, for capitalism to break out uh, because the feudal lords, the dukes, had the right to claim the property, own the property. Uh, guilds uh, uh, right, uh, are a, a move away from that, uh, in a sense, sort of like guilds were sort of like uh, 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 unions, but organized by the businesses. So in a, t in a city... Uh, there was a sort of a, a goldsmith's uh, guild, a shoemaker's guild, uh, a clockmaker's guild, uh, etc., etc., etc. Uh, but even the guilds, in some ways, uh, could get in the way, at least in time did get in the way uh, of the economic freedom, uh, liberty necessary uh, for capitalism to, uh, to you know, uh, arrive and thrive. So, What's being said in the quote that I just read uh, is that the cities started to realize that for them to prosper, they needed to be out from under the control uh, of dukes and lords uh, and kings, if they could, and needed to be self-governing because they needed to be able to institute freedom uh, and have governments uh, that maintained relative freedom. The city-states of Italy, Venice, Florence, Genoa, uh, known for developing uh, governments that were republics. Republics go well, uh, as it turns out, with capitalism. Uh, basically meant that merchants sort of make the big decisions. Citizens have more say than they would uh, under a feudal lord or a king. Uh, but it's not quite democracy, but it's a move in that direction. Uh, but how did they do that? Because uh, feudal lords who were used to claiming, you know, uh, control or the right to control uh, for everybody in their jurisdiction, including, you know, uh, merchants uh, and citizens in cities. Well, the feudal lords uh, realized in time that it's more beneficial for me to let these cities in my, you know, area have some relative or complete freedom. Uh, because then they make more money that way. Uh, they're allowed to innovate uh, and sort of go where they need to, trade where they want to, uh, make the uh, you know produce the products they want to, uh, you know chase the ideas they need to, uh, and uh, I can tax them, uh, and uh, I can go to them for loans uh, when I need to, and it, it's mutually beneficial instead of me sort of uh, trying to control everything they do and tax them incessantly. Uh, and, you know, uh, uh, leave them no leeway, uh, it's better for me uh, uh, to uh, let them have freedom. Once this sort of arrangement, uh, and it wasn't one single arrangement, usually it was a number of decisions and you know, over long periods of time, but uh, this is what really, uh, I think, what set capitalism in motion uh, in uh, uh, the northern Italian city-states and spread fairly quickly from there. Uh, Professor Stark, who I've quoted already, says further, although capitalism developed in the great monastic estates, which means the monasteries, where the monks live uh, and the abbots uh, run, uh, uh, you know, or, or you know, control the monks. Uh, so, uh, so he's saying that capitalism first developed in uh, uh, the monasteries. We'll kind of bypass that issue, uh, but he's really saying that it really kind of found its real voice. Uh, you can see sort of its roots in the monastic estates, uh, found a receptive setting in the newly democratic Italian city-states, relatively democratic. In the 10th century, these city-states emerged as the banking and trading centers of Europe. Subsequently, they industrialized and began producing a large volume of manufactured goods for export, 
For example, eyeglasses were mass produced by plants in both Florence and Venice, and tens of thousands of pairs were exported annually. Perhaps the most striking aspect of Italian capitalism was the rapid perfection of banking. Banks proliferated. By the 13th century, there were 28 independent banks in Florence, 34 in Pisa, 27 in Genoa, 18 in Venice. That doesn't, that's not a lot of banks by our standards today, of course, but if you were asked before uh, you, you saw this, uh, how many banks existed in you know, Italy, period, uh, in, say, 1300, uh, would you have guessed there would have been dozens and dozens of them? Uh, uh, probably not. Uh, a number of families became famously rich and powerful, uh, and at the top of the list, undoubtedly, is the one you see in the bottom left, the de' Medici family. Uh, a Florentine a family, the patriarch of the family was a businessman, trader, uh, merchant, made lots of money, and then uh, went into money lending or banking, which is usually the way it happened. Uh, uh, successful merchants making a lot of money in trade and commerce then would start to sort of loan a lot of their excess money out to do something with it to make more of a profit. Uh, so the de' Medici became most famous and most powerful for their uh, banking prowess, uh, became the dominant uh, bank really in Europe over time. Uh, uh, but they started sort of as a sort of a regular trading uh, commercial firm. The family, uh, and this is just to give you an example, the, the Medici are an extreme example of it, but there are other families, uh, you know, capitalist families, we could say, in northern Italy and eventually beyond that develop this kind of power and clout because of their money. The, the Medici's put two popes uh, uh, on uh, the uh, throne of St. Peter. Uh, so uh, two of their family members uh, subsequently became pope. I say became, uh, but how do you think they became pope? Well, they basically bought their way. Uh, th this was not something invented by the Domenici's. It was rampant through the Middle Ages and into the Renaissance uh, uh, and beyond. So it was basically, in a way, kind of accepted. I'm not saying I mentioned it right, but it was going to. Uh, if you really wanted the uh, papacy, if you wanted to be the Pope badly enough, you had to have a lot of money. Family did, or you better borrow enough money. And then you pay off all your other rivals who are running for Pope as well after the last Pope dies. Uh, and you buy them off and say, I'll pay you this much to step down and not run against me. And if you buy off everybody, uh, uh, you win. Or if you buy off as many as you can, you have a greater chance of winning when the cardinals uh, get together uh, uh, to select. So you've basically paid off cardinals uh, who were otherwise planning to, you know, vie for the papacy uh, themselves, and you've bought them off. The Manchi certainly had the cash to do it, and they showed it by uh, putting two popes uh, uh, right, uh, into the Vatican. Uh, they also had a number of uh, uh, cardinals uh, themselves. Um, uh, so the, the Medici family's power uh, uh, you know, overlaps with, uh, by you know, deliberate effort, the, the power uh, of the church or the power that the church could bequeath on individuals and families. Moving to political developments in the High Middle Ages, which are significant as well, another example of vitality, we see uh, the beginnings of centralized states in Europe. Uh, we've seen kingdoms already, though they broke down famously during the feudal period of the early Middle Ages, and they're making a kind of comeback here, but they're making a more firm comeback uh, that in many places doesn't go away uh, after this. England, you see on the screen here, uh, is a perfect example of it, but also true of France and other European countries as well. That's not to say that this is a positive development for people, citizens, or subjects, as they were seen or called at the time, uh, because uh, kings uh, of this period, and this is true not just in Europe, but they still tended to be parasites, as uh, William McNeil famously refers to them as in his books as macro-parasites, uh, that kings really weren't, with exceptions, about... Uh, taking on the interests of their their subjects. They were there to take as much money and loot uh, you know, for themselves and their friends and their upper class wealthy and you know, friends and family as possible. The idea of public service. They, they were there uh, to protect and promote the interests of the people uh, was basically a foreign one. Uh, 
Uh, again, there were exceptions. Charlemagne in Europe was somewhat of an exception. We've seen rulers in other parts of the world that were exceptions to this. Uh, but uh, those are the exceptions and not the rule. The rule is uh, these guys are really macro parasites, and William the Conqueror fits into that category. However, uh, we can look back from you know today, the vantage of hindsight, and see that however uh, self uh, aggrandizing this was for kings like William, uh, that in the long run uh, it laid the basis uh, for positive developments that did over long periods of time uh, benefit the English citizenry, French, uh, uh, you know, uh, public, uh, you know, and on and on. Uh, so the goal wasn't necessarily to help the public at this time, uh, but a lot of what happened then and, uh, you know, uh, throughout the generations, decades, centuries, uh, did move in that direction, uh, even if not intentionally. William uh, the Conqueror, as he became known, had been, before he conquered England, uh, William, Duke of Normandy, uh, a province in northwestern France, actually where the Allies landed on D-Day, uh, much later, of course, in World War II. Uh, so uh, sometimes referred to as William the Bastard because he was born out of wedlock. The Norman uh, aristocracy, uh, uh, Norman uh, uh, nobility, which he was, of course, uh, a sort of the top dog of, uh, was not just French, uh, they had uh, a Viking background. The uh, uh, Norse, uh, the Vikings, uh, had actually conquered and settled uh, in Normandy. Uh, and so uh, the bloodline uh, of these guys, uh, like William, uh, was not just French, it was also Scandi Scandinavian as well. The uh, uh, Normans, uh, uh, essentially uh, groups f uh, from uh, Scandinavia, from Viking background, uh, show up in other places too. They control much of southern Italy uh, during uh, most of the Middle Ages. Sicily, uh, you know, further south in Italy, the island off the coast of southern coast of Italy, off the heel of the boot of Italy. So uh, Norman stems from Normandy, uh, but there's uh, a French slash uh, Scandinavian uh, connection here. Uh, David Howarth wrote a book on William's uh, conquest of England from across the channel, said he had spent his whole childhood, probably every day of it, either in war uh, or the sports that were training for war. He was probably illiterate, devoid of any, in any intellectual or artistic interest, God-fearing, uh, just uh, when he was not angry uh, uh, and absolutely intolerant. Autocracy uh, and, uh, is always an oversimplification of the art of government. But that was what Normandy needed, and humble men following teams of oxen up the Norman furrows had reason to be grateful. So let's unpack this one. What he's saying is that this guy was a typical ruler, king, duke of the time, no intellectual artistic interests uh, could be pretty brutal and was pretty brutal but did bring uh, you know even if it was by the th sword or threat of violence uh, stability and security and law and order and this is why uh, humble men following teams of oxen means farmers had a reason to be grateful uh, if you lived uh, in the 11th century in France or anywhere in Europe you probably wouldn't need or require a king uh, that was concerned about your rights, which didn't exist at the time anyway, at least not recognized as such, uh, but uh, you would have been uh, happy just to have somebody that could bring law and order. And this guy certainly could do that. Uh, he seems to have had uh, ability as a political leader uh, in all the right ways for the time. And he took the system that he created uh, in Normandy uh, to make himself kind of the number one uh, lord or liege lord in uh, uh, Normandy, uh, again, a province uh, in France, uh, and through kind of a, a feudal uh, structure whereby he doled out uh, uh, fiefs or grants of land to vassals, subordinate uh, nobles, uh, in ways that m made a legal uh, tie between the the duke and everybody he uh, granted land to, uh, and there were sort of mutual obligations, legally, uh, customarily, uh, traditionally, uh, and he sort of had, he, he, he was able to manipulate or, or set up 
structure this uh, feudal uh, system uh, in Normandy. Uh, it lasted sort of beyond the uh, in Normandy beyond the you know period we usually think of the feudal system lasting in a way that uh, gave him sort of the utmost uh, power and control. When he decided to invade England in 1066, uh, he that's what he knew, uh, was sort of creating a feudal structure, uh, and so not surprisingly, that's what England kind of ended up with uh, after he uh, was victorious uh, and made himself king of England. Uh, he kind of just imposed a larger uh, feudal structure, making uh, himself the king now, uh, and the king is the ultimate liege lord, and all the dukes now are his vassals, and on down from there, and he's granting them land in respond, uh, in return for uh, their loyalty, their service in you know military operations, uh, they're serving him by paying taxes or collecting taxes from the peasantry, and on and on. Uh, why did he invade England at all? Well, the Anglo-Saxon king Edward the Con uh, Edward the Confessor died uh, just before uh, he invaded, and there were three claimants to the throne. Uh, so uh, he was one of the three claimants to the throne, uh, and all three of them fought it out uh, for control of England. Uh, and uh, the last man standing of the three was William the Conqueror. Uh, at the Battle of Hastings in 1066, uh, he vanquished Harold Godwinson, uh, advisor to the recently deceased uh, King uh, Edward the Confessor. And not only did William uh, defeat um, uh, Harold's army uh, uh, on the field of battle in southern England, uh, Harold was actually killed in the combat as well. It certainly made things easier uh, for William afterwards. So he went from Duke of Normandy to William the Conqueror, or William the uh, First, first person named William to be King of England, uh, after the Battle of Hastings in 1066. And he uh, fairly quickly, uh, and certainly effectively, centralized power in England. Uh, meaning uh, he sort of took control. And the the Anglo-Saxon monarchy before that, just before, uh, and you know, going further back, had been structured in a way where there was a certain amount of decentralization of power in England. Uh, he got rid of that and tightened control. So the central government uh, from this point forward starts to take on sort of more and more power. And this is where we get back to something I just said a few moments ago, and that is that the centralization didn't necessarily look uh, favorable to you uh, if you were you know, underneath it, if you were an average uh, farmer or artisan or something. Uh, but it's in the long run uh, that this ends up being, I think, beneficial uh, to England uh, and the public, you know, generations, uh, you know, much uh, later on. Uh, he took control of all the land uh, and sort of uh, parceled out fiefs, again, based on uh, you know, loyalty, uh, and, you know, what he's going to get in return. Uh, he did keep some of the English system of organization himself, which showed, I think, you know, one of the examples of his shrewdness as a leader. The uh, English Anglo-Saxon system had basically counties uh, at the local level uh, divided into uh, called shires, County Shire. Uh, if, if you look at a map of England today, you see that that uh, word Shire at the end of every you know, every other name of a place. Uh, so uh, it's basically county, uh, and the head uh, judicial official uh, uh, was a sheriff. So we get our word sheriff from this period, uh, Anglo-Saxon period and beyond. So he kept this. Uh, it's just that he made sure that the sheriffs in control of shires or counties. Uh, were now more than ever before uh, controlled by or guided by uh, the monarchy from above. Uh, so he didn't allow as much leeway, uh, made them answer to you know, edicts coming from the central government, his own, but nonetheless uh, still kept that uh, administrative uh, legal uh, system uh, in place. Uh, about 20 years later, uh, he had something compiled that became known as the Domesday Book, where he sent out agents uh, to all shires in England uh, to basically do a census uh, and an accounting. Uh, why? Uh, well, you can probably guess. He wants to find out uh, what he has and uh, what he can tax. Uh, and it got pretty specific, uh, you know, given the constraints uh, of you know, 
not having the technology like computers that we do today, but they counted not only heads uh, of people, but heads of uh, sh you know sheep. Uh, it counted how many water mills there were, again, into the thousands already. That's part of the reason we know uh, they counted this pretty accurately. So, uh, But this is a good example of centralization in England and other places going on as well. Uh, this kind of thing uh, was somewhat new, certainly done uh, this uh, systematically. So uh, you know, it's easier to govern effectively, uh, to centralize power, uh, if you have lots of information and data uh, about sort of uh, you know what is where and how much you have. So uh, quantification becomes increasingly important. One of uh, his successors in the same line of kings, Henry II, uh, famous for a lot of things and did a lot of significant uh, uh, things historically, but most importantly, I think, uh, was his contribution to the development of common law. He didn't invent common law, uh, uh, but uh, he uh, sort of, uh, through his own uh, power and leadership, uh, did sort of put it, I think, sort of more firmly uh, as part of the English legal system. Uh, I asked the question at the top, is law about justice or power? Well, it can, of course, be about both. Uh, is it more about justice or power? Well, that depends, I think, on time and place. The main point I'm making here is that we tend to assume that law, understandably, is supposed to be about justice. Uh, but a law can be totally unjust. Because what really matters is who makes the law for, for what purpose. So something can be law just because the king, you know, depending on what the system of government is too. If the king has the power to make something a law without anybody else having any say in it, uh, he can make whatever law he wants. Uh, so laws can be unbelievably unjust. The Nazis passed a series of laws uh, once uh, Hitler came to power. Uh, does that, did that have anything to do with justice? It had nothing to do with justice. It had to do with them finding yet another way to exercise uh, their power. Uh, common law uh, developed eventually into, uh, I think, a system of justice, uh, fortunately, uh, but uh, you know, not totally devoid uh, of uh, you know, interests of power as well. So was common law constructed, meaning was it, is it explainable, uh, you know, how common law uh, came to be, how the English legal system came into existence at all through leadership from figures like Henry II, or was it something spontaneous, a spontaneous order, as uh, scholars uh, sometimes call it, going back to famous mid-20th century scholars' uh, work? Uh, well, I think it's a little bit of both. Uh, overall, I think common law uh, is an example of a spontaneous order, meaning that the law developed on its own. Uh, it wasn't sort of the creation or a plan of any one person. Uh, it unfolded through the process of time. Because common law uh, really uh, is uh, the English legal system uh, uh, you know, recognized as such by Henry II, guided to some degree by Henry II, but uh, happening... Uh, through court cases, one after another, uh, you know, in one shire or another, north to south, uh, uh, you know, southeast England, uh, uh, all around, and precedents being established uh, that were followed. Uh, so uh, there became a consistency to, to le uh, legal proceedings, to trials, uh, be because it was supposed to be this is a, com a major feature of common law, and that is that the uh, judges, uh, courts, are supposed to be guided, at least in part, by precedents. Previous cases that were similar, or, you know, the same, technically. Uh, okay, the court, you know, 50 years ago had a similar case about water rights, land rights, uh, and the court decided this way, so uh, the court here is going to be guided by, uh, and over time, uh, the idea was you're supposed to be guided by these uh, previous cases, precedents. If you, uh, if that sounds familiar to you and you recognize that, it's because the United States, for the most part, picked up common law uh, for the reason that you also uh, should suspect, and that is that uh, our country originally were 13 colonies uh, belonging to Great Britain, and only after the American Revolution uh, uh, you know, did the United States come into being as a separate uh, independent country. 
but still retaining uh, certain uh, features of uh, its English heritage, including uh, more or less adherence to the common law. Now, it took on its own permutations, uh, and so uh, is kind of a uh, uh, an offshoot of common law, uh, but some of those things are still there today. Jury trials, grand jury indictments, uh, uh, you know, uh, etc. Due process concerns, an adversarial system, uh, which means lawyers are supposed to, uh, you know, as we say in our system now, vigorously defend their their clients. Uh, so it's supposed to be, you know, a, a, you know, uh, like a debate uh, between one side and the other. Oral pleading meant uh, that uh, the attorneys, lawyers, actually make a case uh, verbally. Uh, that sounds like, well, what else would you do? You know, in the ancient uh, Roman world, uh, it was usually done by uh, uh, written pleading. So the lawyers would sort of write out their case, and the judge, or judges, jury uh, would read uh, uh, such things. So uh, due process means concern for not just uh, crimes uh, and you know uh, infringements on property rights, etc. But making sure that the the legal process is done consistently and and you know, fairly. Uh, so the the concern for due process as it started to unfold does show that law was trying to move in the direction of, or you could say naturally moving in the direction of Henry the Second and other leaders trying to move it in the direction of justice. Uh, due process means trying to keep it consistent, uh, so that the same process happens, uh, you know, every single time. Now, does it? Oh, does it happen that way? Did it happen that way every time? No, but a commitment to due process and is likely to make things more consistent as opposed to less consistent. So the law law eventually became autonomous uh, in England. Again, true in the United States by. Uh, association eventually as well, meaning an independent legal system uh, that uh, isn't, uh, you know, leaned on uh, or can't be leaned on by uh, uh, politicians, or uh, at least it's not supposed to be. Uh, so at first there was a clear bias toward the affluent, uh, without totally depriving the rest of society, as Norman Cantor, one of my favorite uh, scholars to quote, as you well know by now. Uh, but over time, uh, it to keep it simple, over time, the common law moved from being mostly about power to being more and more about justice, with certainly some power uh, and all sort of uh, as an ongoing feature. King John, uh, another of the famous uh, uh, kings that uh, had a great deal to do with the development of centralized politics and government in England. Uh, and uh, but in his case, through a defeat, uh, more or less, uh, King John in 1215 was forced to sign the now famous document Magna Carta at Runnymede. Uh, it was his nobles, uh, his sort of major lords, uh, you can see in the picture in the upper left, uh, who forced him to sign this. He's the king, but if you're a king and all of your major uh, dukes or princes or nobles are, are you know, allied together against you, that's not good for your future. Uh, so King John wisely uh, uh, signed this document, even if he didn't want to sign it. Joseph Strayer, uh, one of the great historians uh, on the Middle Ages, now deceased, uh, said the reign of John set them uh, set most of the problems with which English kings were to struggle for the rest of the century. Uh, John had more brains than character, more ambition than judgment. Suspicious and erratic, he never fully trusted his barons or lords, uh, and they uh, could never give him full loyalty. Yet John took on as adversaries two of the ablest rulers of the Middle Ages, Innocent the Third and Philip Augustus, and was defeated in both contests. So we'll come back to that uh, momentarily. But John uh, is not seen as uh, one of the great leaders in English history, uh, kings uh, in history, to put it mildly. In fact, during his time, I love this nickname, during his own time, not to his face, but it became common for English subjects to refer to him as John Lackland because he lost so much territory uh, you know, formerly uh, owned and controlled by the British to foreign uh, powers. 
Uh, so he lost so much land that uh, his nickname became John Lackland. Uh, so uh, not one of the better kings in English history. And again, most known for his surrender uh, at Runnymede uh, and his signature on this great charter or Magna Carta. Uh, and uh, the Magna Carta, as it says, uh, Strayer's book, again, a hallowed document about liberty. Uh, yet the barons and churchmen who drafted it were not thinking in terms of parliaments and constitutions. They wanted to remedy specific grievances and to protect their own rights and privileges. So, yet again, we have another uh, f famous set of circumstances whereby over the long term, up until even the present, uh, Magna Carta, this document, has a, a great deal to do uh, with liberty uh, and freedom uh, in England and in other societies you know, influenced by it, like our own, uh, that benefit the public in uh, you know a lot of important ways. But at the time, uh, that wasn't the intention. The barons, uh, you see arrayed around John there, their own, their concerns were about their own, uh, uh, you know, problems. Uh, so they're forcing the king to sign a document that limits his power to some degree, that forces him to consult with them when he makes certain decisions, uh, not just sort of uh, do things you know, secretly on his own. So they're forcing limits to his power. But they're not saying we're doing this. You know, we're doing this for the people. Uh, you know, we're, we're, the, the, the government is supposed to be of the people, by the people, for the people. Right? That's a concept that comes much later in history. They're doing this to limit the power of the king for their own uh, individual and kind of you know group. It's a small group, uh, an oligarchy. Uh, uh, you know, it, its own needs. Uh, but in the long run, un you know, on an unintended consequence, uh, it does have immense benefit uh, uh, to uh, liberty uh, and what we could uh, call democracy, though that wasn't being thought of then. We now move from political developments to religious ones, religious continuity and change in a universal church. Uh, 